So welcome to the next episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm here with Richard McDonald, who's a very dear friend of mine. We've known each other for a long, long time throughout our business dealings. Um, and he's going to talk about one of my favorite subjects today, simplicity. So welcome, Richard. Great to be here, Deborah. Thank you. Now, our podcast is kind of aimed at business owners who've got an established business, they employ staff, they may have been going for, you know, five to 25 years, they went into the business very much looking for more freedom, more profit, more time to spend with their loved ones and their passions, and possibly have found themselves not achieving that. So we're here to share our experiences, our tips and our tools around how they can actually create a better business, which will lead to a better life. So I understand that you started your first business back in 1976 as a teenager, and since then you've had seven businesses. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your journey and how you've got to where you are now? Certainly. The common theme is, for me, adding value to raw products first was the amazing specialty fibre of cashmere mohair, and we developed a new fibre which was called Kashgora, the yeah. cross between an angora goat and a feral goat. And it was very pioneering, very entrepreneurial to suddenly put a value on the humble goat. And those were crazy days of big highs and big lows and working long hours. But the good news is decades later, New Zealand is exporting about $200 million worth of goat products. That's milk, fiber, and meat. Okay. The next, the next, uh, move for me was to take a corporate role for three years in Europe in that sector, which was animal embryos and genetic transplants. And it was something I knew nothing about, but I quickly learned to hire the best people to do the technical work that I knew nothing about. My skill was bringing together people to get the results and the outcomes I wanted. And it was a complicated project, including a country that was completely locked up and ostracized that was South Africa and building a hub in Harare smuggling genetic material across from the Pompo River from South Africa to Zimbabwe and then building a protocol to remove those animal embryos and legally taking them to a surrogate operation in northern France so I did that for three years and I it was stimulating and exhausting, but, but very, very, very interesting. And I saw an opportunity in Europe that I hadn't appreciated in New Zealand, and that was bottled water. So mm -hmm. something I learned is while you have your corporate job and your steady income, work even harder in your downtime or your annual leave and start another business. So I imported two containers of the brand name New Zealand Natural Water from Kaiapoi near Christchurch to Europe, one to Holland and one to England. And I learned about distribution of water and the hospitality trade and all the other cogs that make distribution of food and beverages work. Fantastic. So that was the catalyst to come back to New Zealand in 1990 and purchase in 1991 a business that had been going since 1861. Wow. Alexander's and they were producing mineral water they called it aerated water and a range of soft drinks and cordials and flavored drinks mm -hmm. and that's when I first relaunched Alexander's as the, as the owner of the brand and other brands of water so I've been involved in the water industry since 1991 it's been complicated and difficult and we've I've had some really difficult years but the next major change was seeing the ability to transform it into sustainable and that is moving out of single use bottles and finding swapper bottle options yep and that's actually i mean when i had the event center at the common you supply those big um, bottles to yes. us for the center there which is fantastic okay so we're going to talk a little bit in a moment about how you simplified the business and created a more sustainable business but before we do that can you just tell me a little bit about um what would you say have been your professional and personal successes recently I mean, it's been a tough year for everybody but what do you say have been your two things that have happened this year I haven't had a lockdown owning an essential business, no lockdown. So getting really close to the clients was is just, it builds a, a love affair. They love the product being delivered reliably seven days a week, regardless of what's happening. Mm 
-hmm. in society and in the political sphere. So you had an amazing opportunity to get really close to them. They depend on you. You obviously want the business and the revenue from it. So that's been a huge, a huge learning curve of loving the client more than ever. And, it's and you said to me before that you had a client that actually throughout that period of tough times um, ex experienced your service and wanted to get more from you because of that. Is that right? Yes. Tell well, us the, a little about the, that. The core business model is a 20-litre bottle of water, which is quite heavy, and it's beautiful alkaline water from Riverhead. Mm -hmm. The fact that I was getting so close to the clients, I was often being told, could you please produce a smaller bottle, but it must be a sustainable swapper bottle option. So that was the catalyst during tough, tough times of 2020 to introduce a smaller bottle of the same product as so many people living in apartments or older people in rest homes can't manage 20 litres. Yeah. Even though they love the product, they wanted a smaller solution. And that's something we've now been able to do. So what are you, what's the solution? Small, identical water, same branding, but a smaller container that's mm -hmm. also steam cleaned and reused again. Fantastic. Okay. And a personal success in the last year? It's being able to man manage. I travelled widely last year, even though we had COVID. I just took the risk. There's no medical insurance if you have a virus issue. And it, it, there is a, obviously a risk. I The personal success was being able to travel for up to 12 weeks last year out of out of Auckland and New Zealand and do important things for me for personal development and looking at new business opportunities and trends and staying safe. And by masking up, I stayed safe and I had my lungs x-rayed before Christmas and they're completely healthy and normal. Excellent. Good to hear. So that's right. So you were telling me that, you know, you spent quite a bit of time traveling in a year when most of us were confined to our own country uh, and you were able to run your business from a mobile phone. Now, I have to say most of the entrepreneurs, when I first start working with them, they really fear that letting go, going away on holiday, going away for a period of time, worry that their business will actually fail. So tell me a bit about how you managed to do that, travel and still run a, a business, a fairly substantial business, right? Well, the, the people that are too nervous or concerned to leave town, they need to take a, a chill pill because New Zealand is blessed and Stephen Joyce was the catalyst about 12 years ago to have an incredible fibre network. So we have very good Wi-Fi compared to all other countries from the far north to the far south. So the entrepreneur can leave home and it's critical obviously to have good data reception mm -hmm. and I found it surprisingly easy to manage your business on your mobile phone. But you must have good people on the ground here though right because in order to do that you have got to trust in the people that you're employing. Well there's two parts this having a business that's simple in the past in the same sector being bottled water I've had very complicated sophisticated factories I now have a very simple system which is far easier to manage, less moving parts. Good people, but simple systems. I'm a huge believer in the, the KISS philosophy, which you often hear about yep. in your role. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, and it that. really does work. So I, I worship the KISS principle. Keep it simple and have a system by texting and occasionally talking to people or running it anywhere in the world. So if I'm right, you went from having quite a large kind of factory and warehouse down in Christchurch, yes. and then you move that operation up to River Riverhead, is it, up here in Auckland? Yes. And it's a much smaller, much more compact operation, um, infinitely more sustainable. Yes. Can you just explain, I suppose, a couple of things for me? First of all, why did you decide to do that? And what was the process you went through to think about how you could simplify it? And then what has been some of the challenges that you've had in, in terms of implementing that? Great question. It's really important in your life to to take time out to read and to talk to people and to expand your networks. And I became very aware in about 2012 that people were ready to move on from single use bottles to a more sustainable model. And a very sustainable model is one that a bottle that's reused hundreds of times. Yeah. And that's how I transitioned the business. I physically brought nothing from Christchurch. I started literally in a green field with a completely new way of looking at it, and that is 
everything is sustainable, reused, and no warehousing. So vans come in with empty bottles, they're inspected, steam cleaned, refilled and placed straight back in the van, no double handling. So just in time and, and yeah, you said no double handling. Incredibly That's... just in time, so you need reliable equipment that is never going to let you down to back up the just in time. But yeah. it's, the carbon footprint is absolutely minimal and I believe my brand of water sold in Huckleberry throughout Auckland is the lowest carbon footprint in Australasia because the factory is only 19 kilometres away yep. and it's the bottles reused and reused. Fantastic. Okay. And so what sort of challenges do you, do you have though? Because you had this idea, you obviously did some industry or, or um, did some research around what the trends were in the industry. You had this idea, you decided to start a new plant up here. What would be the biggest challenges do you think you in terms of trying to simplify things down? The biggest challenge we as entrepreneurs always have is not a lack of ideas and <laughs> clever, clever thinking. It is a market. So for me, I had to go to Sao Sao Paulo in Brazil for four days to a launch of another sustainable water system. And by showing that initiative, I came back and spoke to the senior person in Huckleberry that had always given me the cold shoulder. And I said, what I've seen in Brazil last week is just a revolutionary. You must take me seriously. And that was the catalyst to finally get Huckleberry to to swap their incumbent brand for my brand and we've trebled sales it's a win-win for for Huckleberry and for ourselves. Fantastic okay and what has been the outcome then of having a simplified business in terms of your life in terms of you know being a, the owner of the business what does that look like now? You have far more freedom and you learn quickly to manage things remotely and always have good, a good team on the ground, try and hire people that are sincere and genuine and are going to stand that stand strong with the initiative for a number of years. You don't want to train people and lose them quickly. So how do you keep them engaged and how do you, because um, I mean, on, honestly, trying to keep hold of staff these days is a tough one, right? Um, people very quickly decide that they want to move on, unless they've got a real core uh, belief in what the company is doing. So how do you go about finding those right people? Well, one, one of the people you and I know, and when he was 17, he was drinking alkaline water and raving about it. And so I'd said to him some years ago, I'd love you to work for me. And he now does alternate works, which alternate weeks, which suits his other business activities. Excellent. And another is an older person who has no income from his commercial real estate business, loves alkaline water, and is, they're both very, very loyal. And I have other people on standby. Yep. So that they've bought into the whole vision of what you're trying to do, which is sustainable, Low healthy. Low carbon footprint, yep. and they love drinking beautiful water. Excellent. Okay. So part of this um, podcast series is about, you know, sharing our experiences, but also giving some tips and tools and things. If you had to give sort of three tips to our listeners about what they could do to simplify their business, to get a better life, um, what would they be? What are the three kind of key things that you'd like to impart? It's important they let go and expand their networks, expand their reading and look at the, the, the bigger picture, the, the cliche, the helicopter view. Mm -hmm. So often my entrepreneurial colleagues, associates and friends become so locked in their business that they, they don't put their head up to take any fresh ideas and it all becomes a huge burden to them. So they need to take the time to step out into other influences. But they would probably say, but I'm so busy working in the business. I've got all this stuff I have mm. to do. I'm fighting fires. So how did you create that time and that space to do that? Well, like you, I do some consultancy and I'm very bl brutal and blunt with them. And I will say, this is insane. You're going to kill yourself if you don't delegate and 
get some fresh ideas and new thinking around what you're doing. Yeah. So within EOS, we talk about delegate and elevate. And we do, we very much look at the, the, especially the owner of the business and the leadership team and say, hey, look, what are all the things that you are doing that A, you, you know, you don't love or you're not very good at? And how could you actually delegate those other people to elevate you to your, your higher mm. potential, which is your unique ability, the things that you can do that really add value to the business? So do you make specific time to work on your business? Uh, no. Okay. How how do you find the time then? What do you do to make sure that you don't get caught up in that day to day stuff? I work the opposite way. I do other stuff all the time and a little bit of business. Okay. Excellent. So I've reversed it completely around, and my energy is focused on talking to the clients every week. I'm with yeah. with the clients, and they love it. Okay. Fantastic. And you learn about your own team members and how they like them and they're getting to know their stories. And... Yep. Hmm. Okay. Next tip, what else, what else would you recommend for, for business owners who perhaps are struggling to let go and struggling to, you know, um, lift themselves out of that day-to-day side it's of the business? It's really important to identify your strengths and weaknesses. And for many entrepreneurs, weaknesses, administration, accountancy, taxation. So always delegate that and find an accountant that's a little – feral and I have someone who's come from Greymouth and yeah. they are fantastic because they have that little bit of feralness to them and I've introduced that that accountant to someone else that you and I know and he's saved that business and had an amazing innovative thinking so you never go to your professional advisors that you went to school with or you went to university with or you know from a sports club go and find professional advisors that are completely different to the kind of person you would like to socialize or go fishing with so filling your weaknesses by having people who are a little bit different to you who can yes. actually challenge your thinking um, perhaps introduce new ideas you exactly. wouldn't have thought of and never okay. have yes if you have if you went to someone from your social circle they're more than likely going to be yes women and yes men yep going to someone with a bit of the feral gene they're going to challenge you and and it's a great way of moving forward and not wasting your time on for example accountancy or yep. tax returns when you're far better to be the real entrepreneur so how do you make sure they're not too feral though how do you know the person that you're entrusting your business to actually has your best interests at heart well it's something that you learn with maturity in life you become very good at judging people even before you talk to them and obviously once you've talked to someone you can work out their strengths and weaknesses and get the balance right yep Okay, great. One last final tip, and I often ask um, my my uh, my guests, you know, have you read any good books recently? Is there any good TED talks? Any good documentaries that you could recommend um, for people who are listening in? The book I've just read was finished in November, and we need to pause for me to give you the author's name, but it's it's post -pan the post pandemic world, and the author is an Indian ethnicity. No, is it now read someone and he will look it up yeah. has cnn slot and he's incredibly bright and a, a true entrepreneur and he looks at the world post the trump defeat so it was finished in november yeah. and plotting the next five years forward and he doesn't go into technical details about viruses but comments very wisely that they will always mutate and within days of me reading it, suddenly there was a massive new mutation in South Africa and the United Kingdom that has swept the world. That's yeah. exactly what he predicted. Right. He talks about robots replacing the trucking transport industry. He identifies certain countries where the biggest single employment is truck driving. Yep. So in 10 years' time, there's going to be massive disruption as robotic trucks take over from human-driven trucks. Makes sense. So in it's some a, good, respects, a very good it? book if you had children or mentor how to plot their future in, in the changing trends of the world. So what does the future hold for you, do you think? More of the same. Just it's a, I can continue a business like this. Uh, well, and you and I have a role model who's now over 80. I would like to be in a similar situation, keep very active right into your 80s. Yep. Okay. And so if people want to get hold of your products and services, like where, where would they, so we've talked about Huckleberry, obviously. Um, yeah, Huckleberry's, is that the best uh, place? Huckleberry is the prime client for the 
20 litre swap of bottle. It's, yep. You get all of 20 litres of water for only $14 Excellent. and pay a deposit on the bottle, which is refundable. Mm. So it's a simple business model and it is a great experience drinking beautiful alkaline water with a pH of nine. Tell me what you do with your spare time. You know, you said you talk about simplifying the business and it creates more spare time. I know that you help other businesses. What else do you like to well, do? Well, like you, I love mentoring. I yep. do it as a volunteer, but I am ruthless with whom I decide to mentor. And I don't sit and talk to them at coffee shops. We go biking, walking, stand up paddle boarding yep. and having great arguments. And I find that excellent exercising and mentoring. It's a great combination for me. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, one last little thing for our listeners before you go. What do you think the the future of the world looks like? What's next? You know, what's this year got in store for us and beyond this year? We live in the most amazing world. I'm just overwhelmed with the innovation and the the talent out of the young New Zealanders. I've spent a good part of last year in America. The same talent is there too. The youth of the world have so much going for them. They are so smart. They're so connected. In New Zealand, because we have fantastic data transfer, high-speed internet, we are so connected. So the world has never been a better place to live. I know there's a couple of small challenges, but they're insignificant compared to yep. the optimism that I have for the young people. And you've just got back from America. So what were things like over there? Well, it's the most amazing time to travel. There were, There was empty spaces everywhere. There's a, a, a bull that you probably can all relate to outside in Wall Street, and I've seen it many times, and there's usually 500 people lining up, up to touch a certain part of the anatomy <laughs> yeah. of the bull. <laughs> yes. In November, there were four people. So it's wow. a great time to travel for, for empty airports and empty public facilities. Yeah. You know, luckily, the number of the Smithsonian institutes have opened in beautiful Washington, D.C., and it was a great time to go back into their museums. And I couldn't, it was an excellent time to travel. Okay. I kept safe. You know, we were masked up all the time, yeah. and but interacted with hundreds of protesters from the left, the right, the middle, and engaged with them. But I always had a mask on, and my friends did too, and none of us were sick. Yeah. And how was quarantine coming back into the country? Oh, can we change the subject? Okay, good. Right. Well, we'll probably it's, be a it's, nice it's, place to wrap up there then, uh, perhaps. Entrepreneurs <laughs> hate the, the confinement. The <laughs> yes. Being told what to do. We hate that, yes, don't we? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, well, you're back, you're safe, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing um, so openly your experiences. I'm sure that our, our listeners will find it very interesting. And I wish you um, more simplicity and more freedom over the next couple of years. Thank you, Deborah. Good luck for 2021 for you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.